Hello, Assalamu Alaikum and welcome to Sports Extra. I'm your host Ahmed Nawaz and this is the latest roundup of sports that we're going to be talking about. We've got so much to talk to uh, and about talking about as well because there's uh, plenty to discuss regarding different sports. Let's take a look at the lineup that we've got for today. We're going to start things off with the Pakistan Super League. Uh, of course, it concluded, but now moving shift and moving focus towards the Test Series. Now, I keep on saying that one uh, momentous occasion also paves way for another one. And Australia in Pakistan is truly historic, but I want people now to focus on the test match itself. First test match at the Rawalpindi Cricket Stadium on the 4th of March, which is a Friday. It <coughs> will begin in handsome fashion. It is the Richie Benno and Abdul Qadir Trophy, as the series has been named. The trophy was unveiled as well with both the captains, Babar Azam and Pat Cummins for Australia. And all the hype is there. Australia, a better side as far as the experience and on paper is concerned and looking at a couple of stats and they did come <clears throat> after a strong bashing of England in the Ashes as well. So obviously very important to her for Pakistan and for Australia as well because a lot of their players, almost all of their players have uh, shown very uh, you know keen interest in the series. They've said that they're very excited to make history in Pakistan and uh, this is of course an important series but at the same time they've also realized that Pakistan is a strong opposition in their own home conditions. And that's why they said that Pakistan can surprise us and that's why we're ready for the challenge. So we will be discussing that in detail. Of course, uh, Pakistan has got some problems of their own with the, the fast bowling department being depleted, but still plenty in there, a lot of combinations that need to go into the test match. And also, I think the fact is that what kind of pitch would be there at the Rawalpindi Cricket Stadium for the Beno Kadir first test match that we will take, uh, that we will see. Here as well, Haris Sof, of course, testing positive for COVID-19. Fahim Ashraf out with an injury. Hassan Ali out with an injury. So, obviously, we've got to discuss what the combinations are going to be. Important series for the captain, Babar Azam himself as well. Uh, he, of course, wants to get back into prime form. He's there for Pakistan and he always will be there for Pakistan. So, we'll discuss that in detail. After that, we'll move on to more cricket. We'll obviously discuss the World Cup in New Zealand, which is the ICC Women's World Cup. The warmer fixtures have been taking place. Our girls in green have been performing superbly. They've managed to beat Bangladesh by uh, a good margin. They've, they've had a good game against Bangladesh women, but uh, they've also managed to beat uh, New Zealand as well uh, in their previous match. But uh, New Zealand, on the other hand, have chased a 322-run target against Australia, probably one of the two top sides in the Women's World Cup. It was a thriller of a contest, a runs galore. 322 was chased down and it was of course a warm-up fixture but sets the bar for the tournament very high as well. And after that we'll be moving on to football where we will be discussing uh, football in detail where uh, Spurs have been stunned by Middlesbrough and that's a uh, thing to discuss because I saw a stat as well where Tottenham Hotspur now are, uh, you know, there, there were a number of days given in thousands that uh, they have been away from a trophy. So we've got to discuss that in detail and obviously Millsborough are through to the quarterfinals of the FA Cup. So they've got a lot to look up to, but it's been uh, typical of the North London club. That's uh, been said by Alan Shearer. So we'll be discussing that in detail as well. And then of course at the end, we've got a very special and interesting thing to show you. And I'll discuss that in detail once we move on to that as well. Time now to introduce our guest in studios for our first segment. And of course, it is cricket. It is Pakistan against Australia. It's test cricket. And that's why I've been pleading to everybody who's watching that please go and watch the test match. I know you're very hyped up about uh, the one-day series, about the lone T20 in Rawalpindi. You want to see some action. But I would uh, urge you to take your children, take your siblings, take your friends and watch a test match in Rawalpindi. You know, a red ball cricket is always interesting. Imagine Mitchell Stark bowling, Pat Cummins bowling, Babar Azam batting there as well. It's Australia against Pakistan, a test match at the Rawalpindi Cricket Stadium, at the Pindi Cricket Stadium as it, it is most commonly known. You don't see that every day. So please go out there and watch a test match. Time now to introduce the guest in studios. First of all, uh, finally, we've got him back. We've managed to pull him back, but he's <laughs> finally back as well. Uh, cricket commentator, cricket expert, uh, involved in cricket uh, all over Pakistan, globally as well. K. Asif Ahmed has joined us finally once again. Assalamu alaikum, how are you? Wa alaikum Welcome assalam. back, sir. Thank you. What the, how are you doing? I'm good. Uh, does it feel good to be back? Did you yes, miss us? Yes, of course, I was missing you. That, that's great. And you're missing someone else? No, I'm always <laughs> missing you. You know that. So, you know, it's great to have Asif back. And, of course, uh, 
including Asif, uh, the next guest that we've got has been a regular part of Sports Extra since the show's inception. So a bit of history there. Of course, he's an old chap. But uh, today we're going to term him as the birthday boy who's joining us. He is Mr. Ali Mehdi. Assalamu alaikum, Ali Mehdi. Happy birthday to you, sir. Wa alaikum salam. Thank you so much for the wishes. Uh, well, I think uh, from starters, from me, uh, K. Asif, Sabeel Hazir, or Salan Shirazi, Asad, yes, everybody, Vakar, the entire team, Kainat, and everybody there in the MCR, PTV World in general, PTV at global levels. I think from all of us, a very, very happy birthday to you. And you, you forgot one name, Arsalan Shirazi. I did say that. All you right, didn't sorry. listen to that because <laughs> these days I've heard you're ignoring Arsalan Shirazi. You know? so I'm but Ali Mehdi, a very, very happy birthday. Pleasure. Thank you so much for the wishes. More coming your way. Good health, uh, prosperity, and all of Allah Almighty's blessings. Thank you so much for the wishes. Always a pleasure coming here for, to be part of this PT world. Uh, You'll PT always world be family. part of our family. And you know, it's a special <clears throat> occasion. The celebrations will continue, but after the show, so, um, you know, I'll send you pictures of what we're celebrating. So, you can, you can watch the celebrations of Ali Mehdi's birthday. Coming back to the game itself, historic test match, a couple of days away now, all the hype. I know people are a bit skeptical because there is rain on the weather on Sunday. <coughs> but once it begins, it's going to be history. But uh, very tough Australian side. I keep on saying this. Now we've got a depleted fast bowling lineup. It's going to be an exciting encounter. Uh, yes, and first thing, uh, in your introduction, mm. you were urging people that to go to the stadium and watch the match, but please uh, try to understand that the latest news is that all the tickets have been sold out for the first three days. Mm. So two days remaining, yes, your request for the last two days. No, okay. no, actually when the 100% capacity was given by NCOC, okay. the amount of tickets was increased again. So all me right. and you can still make it for the three days. Yes, <laughs> I'm still searching and I'm still requesting to Shirazi sahab if we could and do for it. Tickets. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and uh, I've read his, uh, uh, his, his status actually on Twitter. Mm -hmm. Please do Don't not ask, ask for the tickets. tickets. <laughs> yeah, the well, I call him the ticket man. He's got yes, yeah. yes, fantastic guy mm -hmm. actually. All right, so if you talk about the Australian side, very, very strong side, and uh, three plays, uh, three batters, uh, mm -hmm. of course, Steve Smith and uh, David Warner, and then Levashine. Mm -hmm. And when we talk about their fast bowling, uh, Pat Cummins, Mitchell Stark, and Josh Hazelwood. And uh, if we see the comparison that Pakistan is missing now, because you know some of the injuries, some of the people they got uh, positive, mm -hmm. uh, COVID positive, and uh, Harry Strofe is no more in the side. And uh, I was showing my, my concern. If you do remember that, uh, uh, though he's an energetic guy, but still uh, uh, don't have any experience in Test cricket and especially in domestic cricket as well. On the other side, when we talk about Naseem Shah. If you see his performance uh, in PSL, though it's a T20 cricket, but the line or length, it does matter. It is improved. Yes. yes. And really, and uh, once again, credit goes to their coach, Umar Gul, the way he was working mm -hmm. with him. So I think, yes, uh, it would be a fantastic match. And uh, with some of the difficulties for the, for the three of the batters, as I've mentioned, because mm -hmm. uh, I'm not talking about the rest of the batters. All of them really good, but they're the key batters for the Australian mm -hmm. side. And, uh, but this is their first experience in Pakistan. And whenever you're playing away series with Pakistan, and you know that uh, we had fantastic matches um, mm -hmm. because uh, due to uh, terror, the menace of terrorism, we were playing uh, in Dubai or in England, any neutral venue. But now this is the time the Pakistan, if they're facing here, uh, I think Pakistan could give them good, good and a good tight. Tough time. Yeah, good and tight. Mm. Uh, uh, tight Definitely, time. Pakistan's yeah. got a very good squad, and we've heard it from the Australians as well. Nathan Lyon mentioned that it's going to be a very exciting contest. But I think we'll continue the discussion. We've obviously got a lot of players to discuss. But Ali Mehdi, particularly about this Australian side, I keep on saying it's not a pushover side. It's a complete squad that they've brought to Pakistan. Look, they're the number one side in the world, mm -hmm. and then there's a reason for that. You look at that squad, and forget the team. Look at the squad. There are no gaps in that squad, too. They have a player-for-player -player replacement for mm -hmm. each and every player. And the fact of the matter is they've just bashed the, the palms, the English actually <laughs> in, in Australia, too, right? and quite heavily, too, I believe, winning 4 so, you know, look, they came over here, they had one mindset in mind, to conquer the final frontier. They want to win in South Asia. They ha this is the first of three series. They're going to play, obviously, in Pakistan, then they go to India later this year, and they're going to play in Sri Lanka. So if you look about it, about a total of nine test matches over there, too. So for that reason, they've come well prepared. They've been playing on pitches, you know, for the uh, to, to counter reverse swing, to counter spin, you know, dust bowls, too. And they've come very well prepared. And most importantly, Ahmed, is the mindset over there. 
they're looking very confident. You can see that they're looking confident, they're trusting up their abilities too. On the other side, unfortunately, Pakistan has some injury <coughs> concerns. So Pakistan, you know, being the home team, yes, will go into this series, you know, confident too. But you know, you the Australians are no pushovers because you look at that team from top from number one to eleven, there's not a single player who's out of form too. We forgot about Usman Khwaja, the Islamabad born player mm -hmm. too. He's one, you know, who had the best uh, series against Pakistan when we they visited the UAE in back in 2018. This is a completely different team from mm -hmm. then. So that's why I would have to say that yes, it's a new frontier for them, but they're going to be extremely difficult uh, to play against. Extremely uh, difficult. One, one yes, thing really important, you know, mm -hmm. that uh, uh, um, though we are playing in our uh, home country, home conditions, each and everything, the home crowd. But even then, we are in the pressure. Why? Because we are playing yeah. the top-notch side of the world. Mm. The, uh, and that's why I was uh, you know, taking the names of the players. And if you talk about the Pakistan players, look, if we are going with the Abdullah Shafiq, uh, Shan you know, Masood. Shan Masood, you know, mm. once again, he's, he's, he's a very good uh, guy, played really nicely in uh, PSL, and uh, everyone was shocked about his performance. And on the other side, that uh, uh, we are missing, look, on number four, number five, if you talk about, look, uh, two batters uh, for the opening, Shan Masood and Abdullah Shafiq. Mm -hmm. Then, yes, we do have Babar Azam, we have uh, Rizwan, Rizwan, then Fawad Alam. Now, the Azhar issue Ali is. As well. Azhar Ali. Yeah. Now, the issue is that. Uh, uh, what what would be our, our bowling side? Because yeah. if we're going with the two paces yeah. and two spinners, like uh, uh, ha if Harish Rauf is not there, then of course Naseem Shah mm -hmm. and Shaheen Shah Afridi. And on the other side, the two spinners, Sajid Khan, and Sajid Numan. Ali, of and, yeah, and Noman. Uh, mm -hmm. So Noman Ali and Sajid, <laughs> actually. Yeah. So uh, uh, who would be the fifth choice? This is the yeah. question mark. Either we're going with the what's uh, your take? What, what do I you think, think I think we would go with the iftikhar because he's a good batter as well. So just and two fast bowlers in the match. Yes, I, I, so we don't have any other option. A you bus, you can draft in a bus. You One yes. a bus to play so yeah, badly. You can you know, draft him. I'm sorry, I'm interrupting. Uh, you want to add to that? No, thing? I really am upset uh, Abbas is not there. Look, Ahmed, he hasn't performed well over the past one year, but you go back to the England series of 2020. Yeah. He's the sort of player you need to bowl line and length. Mm. You forget in the UAE, when Pakistan played Australia, he was our best bowler. He was getting yeah. wickets so fun yeah, too. That's right. So we're really going to miss on him. And I think Asif would agree. Yeah, look, Naseem Shah is still raw. He did well in PSL mm -hmm. right now. But the important thing is bowling line and length. And there's not a single player for Pakistan who can bowl as well line and length as Abbas, so Ali, he's a big miss. Ali, we had a long discussion concerning Abbas, Abbas. and I was showing my mm. concern. The issue is that, and they've picked him for the reserve players. Yeah. It's not fair, actually. Yeah. And you know that uh, Sana Mir was also with us, and yeah. she agreed over mm. that. So th yes, I totally agree with Ali, but the issue is now you have uh, don't have any other chances Option, that, because yeah. he's in the reserve players. You cannot pull him once again, I mean, on the 11th hour, and you're telling, because I mean, you have to follow the rules yeah. and laws mm. and regulations. Of the game, yeah. Yeah. No, so this would have been ideal. Yeah. Yeah. No, yeah. that's why, to be very honest, that uh, uh, mark his words that we will be missing Abbas, to be very honest, in this series. But I have a question for you. Yeah. You know, I always have good yeah. questions for you. Yeah. yeah. Where is Tabish Khan? <laughs> Where is he? You want me to laugh? No, I want me to smile. <laughs> I want the <laughs> good answer from, from you. I mean, uh, look, the, the, the answer is... Yeah, look, it's been surprising. It's been surprising because at one point you make him debut and, you know, he's the leading wicket taker in your domestic performance. And yeah, that's right. Course, uh, look, if, if you talk about that, uh, we're missing uh, most of the guys. Then I'll mm. ask you that where is Bilal Asif? Exactly. And yes. if you're asking me that where is Tabish, I'll ask you where is Bilal Asif? Bilal Asif is singing. So where is Tabish? <laughs> Tell me again. <laughs> Lal Asif is singing, he's fine with his singing career, he is probably not focused. Uh, no, 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 okay, so I've got another question. So this, this has come right from the MCR, where is Rahat Ali? Where is Rahat Ali actually? This is, lots of the questions are there. But you know, Tabish, I have watched him uh, uh, from last couple of years, mm. the, the way he's bowling in the domestic cricket. Especially in these conditions. In these also, conditions, yeah. this is. Then I will talk about where is Sadaf. Mm. Do you know him? Your co-anchor? No, <laughs> 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 I'm talking to the scholars. Oh, okay. Well, uh, 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 my apologies. I thought you said it's all about Asif and Sada. So maybe I no, think uh, Of course it is. You know that uh, he got tremendous records. Yeah. Yes, absolutely. Sada yes. uh, Hussain had really a yes. tremendous record in yeah. domestic. All right, so let me take full name, Sada Hussain. Yeah. Okay. So the, the issue is that all of the players are missing, mm. and I don't know what our uh, selectors are doing. The people are writing over the Twitter and asking these questions because mm. uh, these are really important questions. 
if Tabish is not there, a single phone call and uh, f from your chief selector and your chief selector mm -hmm. is recording that moment with him. Tabish. You've been covering domestic cricket and, uh, you know, mm -hmm. I wanted to have you on the show because I even had a topic la uh, yesterday as well where a lot of these top wicket takers are missing out. So that same trend continues that we're ignoring merit. Another guy from Southern Punjab who's a leading wicket taker is not even selected in the Pakistan Cup, Ali Usman, I think. Yes, yes, so yes. So we're missing everybody who's top performing. Well, yeah. this is really unfortunate. Right. I think, uh, yeah. Ali, if, uh, if, if you are not picking your place yeah. from the domestic mm. structure and What's just concentrating, yeah, yeah, just concentrating on the PSL, mm. I think it's not fair. And uh, then we, we won't be able to make a good test team, to be very honest. Because mm. once again, I have lots of questions concerning and lots of concerns concerning Harris Rauf, mm. as I've showed before as well, because uh, I have watched him. I'm, I'm his supporter. He's a very quick, good bouncer. Good. Each and everything is there, but still. Not for longer run. No, I'll be very no, honest. Yes, don't this, is, this I, is what I, I'm saying. I, I, this I absolutely is what I'm agree with Asif that we love Harris Rauf. Yeah. We understand that he wants to play test cricket. He's he loves not. it. Of course, you've seen Jasprit Bumrah play there as well. <clears throat> you know, things can work out, but maybe a bit more time at the domestic circuit. Now you have more. taken the name of just Jasprit yeah. Bumrah. Let me say again, once again, Ali, that uh, mm. uh, Brian Lara have talked about two baller, two uh, players, mm. one of them the Jasprit Bumrah wow. and the other is the KL Rahul. Mm. That the both of them, sound. both of them are the perfect for mm. the three of the formats. Yeah. Mm. All right, we don't have any player who is uh, perfect for the three of the bats. Definitely, Ali Mehdi, your thoughts that we can probably have. Look, I, I understand that we've been growing on a lot of things, international cricket. Our mm -hmm. batters are power hitting. We're getting yeah. a power hitting coach very soon. A lot of things are working good for Pakistan. The PSL has been great. But, you know, I don't want to be back at square one where now Pakistan is known for producing talent. That way uh, we get a void of talent. Look, let's be very honest. Spinners are not getting that push to the National no, High Performance Center. No Pakistan A games anymore. We're not seeing that talent come up who could just replace the side when needed. It's very unfortunate. That's why we're going into this series. Look at the Australian team. Emma, they're so settled right now. They've got such a big squad because their Sheffield Shield cricket yes. is so oh, yeah. strong mm -hmm. over there. And you have you know, a plethora of talent coming through that conveyor mm -hmm. belt. Whereas mm -hmm. in Pakistan, you know, you talk about the Kaidi Azam trophy. Yes, you have match mm -hmm. winners, you have players, but they're not coming no, through. I, I mean, Lord Kalandas, in there. Lord Kalandas can select Kamran Ghulam, mm -hmm. but the Pakistan Test team will never. Now, Ali, do you know that uh, Kamran Ghulam scored nine centuries in domestic cricket. It makes no sense. And Abdullah Shafiq only two centuries. It makes you know, no sense. Just, Kamran yeah. Kulam has to be in the yeah, squad. Yeah. He has to be in the reserves. It makes no sense why mm. he's in there. That's why you see why is franchise cricket thriving and we are doing mm. better right now. Definitely. T20 yeah. cricket. But it's going to be very exciting of course. We're looking uh, forward to that test match. We're very excited and like I always say it's a real form of the game. We're going to enjoy it every bit at the Pindi Cricket Stadium. Let's take a look at the recap. We discussed Pakistan Australia Test Series in detail. It's now known as the Richie Benno and Sir Abdul Qadir Trophy. That's what the series have been, has been called. It's now the Benno Qadir Trophy. And uh, of course, a great series to look up to. The trophy has been unveiled as well. Both the squads are ready. Pakistan has got a bit of problems with their fast bowling department with injuries and COVID as well. But uh, the test match is one to look forward to. Coming now to the women's side, where our girls in green have been in top form, of course. We know that the ICC Women's World <coughs> Cup is just around the corner. Warm-up fixtures have been taking place. Australia and New Zealand had a runs galore. 322 runs were chased down. The women's game keeps on getting better and better. So I think there, can no, there cannot be any difference now. We need to compare them. They're absolutely superb. Uh, but at the same time, our girls in green have got uh, a lot to uh, say as well. But uh, Kiasif, Australia and New Zealand women, clearly <coughs> one of the strongest teams in the world in terms of women's cricket. And we saw that in the warm-up fixture. 322 <coughs> runs. Yes. So what, do not take them easy, of course. Yes. They're playing good cricket. Their batters are good, ballers are good. And when we talk about the uh, specifically Pakistan team that uh, they've beaten New Zealand and they've, be they've beaten Bangladesh as well, chasing 197, I mean, uh, within in a good condition mm -hmm. where, you know, the every player is performing their role, uh, their play, uh, th th of course, their role. And uh, if you talk about Bisma Maru, Fali Arias, Sana Fatma, and uh, uh, all of them are in good touch and of course that they, they went early there yeah. and they're they're uh, you know gelling up in these in these conditions because the New Zealand's conditions always really difficult for the yeah. Asians you know so I think that's uh, it's a good sign but uh, you'd have a good contest uh, uh, against uh, in, in, in coming co of course you know these are the warm-up matches and warm-up matches of course then when you are playing and uh, all the teams, they are just enjoying the game. Yes. and We so remember that stat. If you win yeah. warm-up matches, your <laughs> tournament is bad. Ali Mehdi, you'd like to add Yeah, to but that. the big one 
Ahmed Oweze. Who is Pakistan playing in their first match? Yes, India. India. <laughs> I mean, you know, once again, Pakistan versus India, the two rivals, arch rivals coming against each other. You know, Pakistan has nothing to lose. They actually played very well, beating New Zealand, the home team, you know, who are one of the favorites too, then beating Bangladesh, like you mentioned too. So they'll be full of confidence, full of, uh, you know, confidence going into this game too. And I think it's the perfect time for them to peak. And if they can somehow beat the, uh, uh, the runners up of the 2017 World Cup, then, you know, the sky is the limit. And mm. I do think that in these foreign alien conditions, Pakistan's got all the talent, especially led by Bismaruf Baruf, that they can actually go in and topple one of the big giants. Right, yeah. It can happen, of course. Yeah. We've got some good performance as well. We've got a report on that. Let's take a look and then we'll continue. Sophie Devine put on a tremendous show at the Burt Sutcliffe Oval as she stayed New Zealand to a chase of 322 to down Australia by 9 wickets with 41 balls to spare. Australia saw four players pass the 50-run mark as they set New Zealand an imposing 322 to win, but ultimately it wasn't to prove difficult at all, thanks to a magnificent 161 not out from Sophie Devine. New Zealand were not daunted by a chase, 42 runs more than they have ever managed in one-day internationals. Instead, Susie Bates scored 63 from 68 balls, then Sophie Devine and Amelia Kerr did what they do best, taking apart a bowling attack. Kerr played her part in a 206-run partnership with an unbeaten 9 as New Zealand knocked off the runs with 41 balls and 9 wickets remaining. There you have it. All you need to know <coughs> about that as well. But uh, I think on a final note, uh, we're all praises for our girls in green. Yeah. We want them to do well, right? Yes, of course. They're in good touch. And the way they've started even in, uh, you know, warm-up matches, it's good. Giving them some mm -hmm. confidence. Some the issue is the only thing that uh, if you're concentrating that uh, the every player should have... Uh, give their personal um, efforts and the you know the individualism is really important whenever we talk about in cricket whenever we talk about it's really important that you're taking responsibility yes absolutely i could do something special for my team mm. so when every player and every player is coming up with this mindset mm -hmm. definitely you'll get success Ali Mehdi, what do you think about the girls in no game? i think they have a very good chance i mm -hmm. mean especially these two wins they've gotten it's going to give them so much confidence yeah. you know they've got look so they've got all that so much talent over yeah there. Ali 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 Sandhu. Bisma yeah. herself, Nida Dar, Diana Beg, yeah, Diana Beg, Nida Dar, and, and experience yeah. over there. Fatma Sana, you Fatma know, Sana, yeah. yes, they've absolutely. got so much experience over mm -hmm, there. Yeah. So, and you know, you know, look, Sana Amir is also going to be in the commentary over mm -hmm. there. You know, her input also will. Yeah, you know, she knows the team, team inside. Yeah, She'll absolutely. also be have some input with the team. So, so I think this could be a tournament where the girls mm -hmm. in green could surprise one Definitely. of the Definitely. Well, gentlemen, that's all we have time for for cricket. Kiasif, thank you very much for being Pleasure. on the show. Pleasure. Birthday boy is always going to be there. Uh, on that note, we're going to take a short break. Uh, obviously, let's take a look at our segment recap. We discuss about the women's in uh, women in green. The girls in green are performing well, but you know the ICC Women's World Cup is all to watch out for. A warm-up game, 322 runs chased down by New Zealand against Australia speaks volumes of where the women's game has now evolved to. And Pakistan has also got success in their two warm-up fixtures against New Zealand and against uh, Bangladesh. So we're looking at a great tournament coming up. On that note, we'll go towards a short break. We'll be right back. Stay tuned. Welcome back to Sports Extra. Time now for our football segment. We're hanging on to the birthday boy and joining us now is my co-host and of course our football expert and football youth coach as well, Sabeel Hazir. Assalamu alaikum, how are you? Well, I'm doing well and happy birthday to Ali. Happy birthday to Ali <laughs> Mehdi. You know, you we're all expecting a big birthday bash of right course, now, for obviously, of, of the show. Uh, let's take a look at what we're discussing. We've got a report on that. It's been a terrific night for football. I'm happy when I'm not on the losing side. If my team's not playing, I'll always be happy. Well, let's take a look at what happened and then discuss it further. Substitute Josh Coburn scored a fine winner in extra time as Middlesbrough stunned Tottenham to reach the quarterfinals of the FA Cup. Tottenham's inconsistent form continued with a seventh defeat in 13 games in 2022 and former England striker Alan Shearer said it was typical of the North London club. Chris Wilder's side, who beat Manchester United in the last round, matched their Premier League opponents throughout and broke the deadlock in the 107th minute. Coburn lashed on to Matt Crook's pass before the 19-year-old thumped an effort beyond Hugo Lloris.
Tottenham hope Antonio Conte is the manager to end their 14-year wait for a trophy, but the North London club will have to wait at least another season. Conte said that it is important to say Middlesbrough played a good game. He congratulated them for the win and said that we have to reflect on our performance and on the game we played. As for championship outfit Middlesbrough, they have now won eight games in a row at the Riverside, but it is this victory that the jubilant home crowd will remember. Well, of course, me and Ali Mary were doing this. We were enjoying <laughs> that. Sabil not because he he's all for the Scottish Premier League supremacy. <laughs> he doesn't like these tournaments. <laughs> but, but but you know, um, uh, clearly a good game. What would you like to add? It's uh, it's it's really interesting how Middlesbrough dominated the midfield yeah. in that game because you'd expect it to be like okay, it's a championship side. If you've just looked at the score and you've just looked at the highlights, you assume okay, it's a hit and run. They've got a couple of chances. They scored and Spurs must mm. have been wasteful. It wasn't the case. Uh, they stacked the midfield, right? They had five midfielders, and although they were playing two strikers on paper, in the game, those strikers were coming quite deep and tracking mm -hmm. quite deep. So um, they were defending like you'd expect them to with all their numbers. But when they were getting up, they were committing. Like, they were committing bodies, and they were really smart. Uh, their goal came from this strategy. They'd commit to one wing, and they often in football... They didn't move around much. Yeah. Uh, a football, uh, often in football, a good strategy is to keep switching wings mm -hmm. and make the pitch wider and bigger. Mm -hmm. But they surprisingly played some very neat football in tight areas on one wing and were looking to break down that side and then just gamble on one pass in the center mm -hmm. or in the goal, case of the goal, just one shot through the center, right? So really good strategy, played off really well and uh, they should be embarrassed genuinely. Not because they lost to a championship yes. side. That Every giant has, has a giant killing at some stage in football mm -hmm. as part of the game. It happens to Spurs more so than other teams where it does happen, right? It's the way they were beat. They did not look like a Premiership as a Championship side. It looked like two very good Championship sides playing each mm. other, which is great for Middlesbrough because they're doing pretty poorly. I think they said eight wins in a row at home. But I bet QPR could have done better. <laughs> probably, because Middlesbrough's away record is atrocious. It's just at home they play well, yeah. right? So they're only like, I think, eight or so in the Championship. Mm. And that's the team that's made uh, Spurs look like another championship side. Yeah. So, well done, Middlesbrough. Absolutely. Well done, Middlesbrough. They had every right to celebrate. But, you know, I've come up with a theory. I, Whenever there's a defensive error in place, I call it the Maguire effect. Mm. So, that's what I. it felt like. Clearly, defensive error, of course. But uh, I think uh, we'd have, have to agree with uh, Sabil that uh, Tottenham only have themselves to blame. Tottenham have themselves to beat and there you go, about 14 years till their last trophy. Mm. I mean, the, you're talking about the League Cup of 2008 was the last time they won. They've come so close so many times but look, this was a golden opportunity for them. Going to the Riverside is not like going to a Galacticos, going to a European giant over, the, over there. And look, Conte had something to prove. He's been very inconsistent, his team, till now and this was the opportunity. But like Samil summed it up very well over here that they stacked the midfield. They choked it out of uh, their Tottenham. Tottenham didn't have much of a chance over there. It was like it was very even, Stephen. About 49, 51 percent mm. possession, and you know the same number of shots are off target. So it very when you talk about that uh, Tottenham squad, you know you've got so much quality from mm -hmm. the defence right up to the top to the strikers too. But they just could not have. They didn't have that cohesiveness over there. They didn't have that chemistry, and that's what exactly they fell right into Middlesbrough's hands. Look, Middlesbrough have been brilliant at home. You know you talk about eight wins at home. Uh, the, in the in the championship, the only t team they actually went to beat was Manchester United in the FA Cup in the previous round too. So unfortunately for you know Spurs, you know this is another opportunity which has gone begging. And look, this could be Middlesbrough's year. They could go deep in this tournament mm. considering how well they played. Do you believe that as well that they could probably go in much longer now? You know, it's interesting. I think you mentioned 2008. 2008 yeah. or 9 was the last time Middlesbrough beat against uh, Chelsea. Yeah, yeah so that's the last time Middlesbrough beat two top flight mm. teams yeah. in the Trumbull FA Cup as well. Yeah. So there, uh, it could maybe they'll have a bit more luck, but uh, still not top sides in mm. uh, City, uh, Liverpool. Yeah. I think yet to play. Uh, they'll play today. Uh, so you've got City, you've got uh, Liverpool, you've got top sides there. Everton, I guess, count as a top <laughs> side as well. But uh, Chelsea still there. Uh, yeah, sorry. Uh, so they've got uh, 
a lot of player, teams ahead of them, but they should be proud making it to the quarterfinals, beating Spurs and doing it comprehensively. And again, if the tie comes at home, if you can keep home momentum going against bigger teams, uh, you know, it's, it, it can happen. Ups, FA Cup is about giant killings. Mm -hmm. uh, in our lifetime, we saw Wigan the same season no, got yes, relegated, beat City yeah, uh, wow. in that final. So, we've seen it in our lifetime. Mm. It's not impossible Both to dream. in 2008. Yeah. So, it's, it's not impossible <laughs> to dream, right? <laughs> it's not impossible to dream. So, let's uh, give Middlesbrough credit. Let's not get too carried away, but there is always a chance. Uh, my team, Stoke, got knocked out by Palace. I thought they put up you know, an amazing fight mm. and uh, they could have actually, I think if they started a few different players gone uh, deeper in. So the premiership sides, because their squads are getting thin, uh, they're being spread thin, like uh, Liverpool City, they're playing in multiple competitions, they're competing for multiple competitions, now the race is on in the Premier League, mm -hmm. the, ch uh, the Champions League is coming up, uh, you know, you've got those fixtures to worry about. So maybe, yeah, with them having a lack of focus, focus probably. Yeah. Or oh, tired legs, mm -hmm. maybe, mm -hmm. yeah, you can nick results. Uh, do you in any way have any... Uh, connection or you know a family term with Michael Carrick <laughs> <laughs> not at all but you, uh, you keep mentioning <laughs> Ali Mehdi a uh, very important point here that Middlesbrough might go forward I, I agree with Sabeel that there are still top sides in this tournament and they're coming back very strong I mean Chelsea Liverpool ha just had a Carabao Cup final which was intense Liverpool's coming strong victory you know they're smelling blood they want to win another cup they can probably do that Chelsea w definitely want to make amends for what they what they did and that was obviously embarrassing with that penalty miss so they want to make amends for that as well City will keep on dominating we know that so still a lot in here and obviously you know Middlesbrough's got some tough competition ahead. The giants of the Premier League are still in this yeah. competition. Look, this is that one competition which, you know, you when you're fighting for the Champions Leagues, for fighting for the Premier League, you know, you slightly take your eye off the ball. Mm -hmm. We saw that last year. Mm -hmm. with uh, We saw that with uh, Leicester against uh, Chelsea when yeah. Leicester actually won that FA Cup mm -hmm. fi final against. And because Chelsea were focusing towards their Champions League, you know, when they were going to play Manchester City. So this is the one uh, tournament where, you know, giant killing comes into and being. Fatigue, and imagine. fatigue, uh, yeah. fatigue comes now let's not forget now this competition is being played in midweek mm. the past two uh, the, you could say the past two rounds have been played in midweek when it happens comes into midweek you know you see some tired legs over there you see that you know the smaller teams they, they smell blood they see an opportunity over here and that's why I think that you know Middlesbrough took full advantage uh, yesterday too mm, you know you've got some other teams too like Manchester City you know they've just won actually they also won 2-0 they're mm. uh, obviously beating Peter Bro too but other than that, you know, the likes of Liverpool, Chelsea, they know that, you know, this they're is... They're all in the game. They're all in the game and they've yeah. got an opportunity this year considering that, you know, these big teams, uh, mm. you know, are still... Uh, Sabil, you know, this is an uh, important factor to discuss. I, I do believe it needs more time and a complete analysis. But, you know, for the time that we have, uh, top flight clubs often tend to go against these smaller clubs and, uh, you know, somewhere down the line, they'll keep on losing or... Uh, Draw is yes an opportunity, but they keep on losing. It's happened more often with Manchester United than any other club since the past <laughs> season. I understand you had that. You to say that. You know, I, I will always understand that deeply. It's a personal point. Why do we see this effect? I mean, I understand a couple of points, as you mentioned, fatigue and lack of focus and everybody probably not playing your full squad. But why is this happening so often? Does that then mean that we've got to adjust scheduling and, you know, reduce the amount of games? So the first thing I, so the three points is the first one is I think they, are, although they do happen often, mm -hmm. they don't happen that often. The majority of the times, the bigger team will crush the smaller mm -hmm. team. So, yes, we see it uh, sometimes and we remember those moments, but most of the time these teams are getting crushed. So, they're still doing well, the top flight size. But the other two reasons I feel are, uh, the other two things we focus on are, A, the money, mm -hmm. the amount of money, even the Champions League people play for prestige, right? The FA Cup has prestige, but it's not the same as the Champions League, even though it's older, right? Mm -hmm. The Premier League revenue. Now, depending on where you finish in the Premier League, it affects your revenue streams. And also, the Premier League is being watched a lot more around the world than the FA Cup. It has a lot more viewership. So, it's, it is, at the end, a business as well. So, they will focus on the competitions and try to success in the competitions where they are monetarily incentivized to do well. That's another reason. And the third is, I think when you are a top flight side, you stack your team full of talent. Now, uh, squads aren't just 11 men. They're 20 men deep of top, top talent, right? Mm -hmm. Even if you're a mid-tier Premier League side, you've got decent backups. So you expect often those backups to come in and be able to crush a championship side. So you don't really think, well, 
maybe on the day these guys are more motivated and they can win and they have more game time you think oh well these are better players so they show over overconfidence comes yeah. yeah so it is a bit of that and obviously the factors we mentioned which is fatigue and the mm -hmm. midweek the fact that you're playing if you're a top four side you're playing Champions League midweek mm -hmm. you're playing FA Cup midweek you're playing Premier League, Premier League on the weekend mm -hmm. sometimes you have to make up Premier League fixtures mm -hmm. on the weekend midweek. the schedule you mentioned schedule congestion that uh, that congestion is something in the Premier League specifically they've been talking about for years because it's one of the few leagues mm -hmm. top leagues especially which don't have a winter break mm -hmm. they make people play on Boxing Day, they play throughout the winter um, and it gets too much. Yes, I understand there's a lot of money in the game, a yeah. lot of revenue, but the top flight sides are playing and we've in seen so many the, competitions. Yeah, and we've seen the clash, clash with other leagues or other competitions well, where sides have to forfeit games. We've so we saw that with Spurs, yeah. right, in the, in the European mm -hmm. competition. Mm -hmm. So it does happen. And that happens when you have so many fixtures. So we, there is some of fixture congestion. It affects English teams a whole lot more. So it's clearly a FA problem, an English FA problem. Mm. It's not happening that much in Germany. It's not happening that much in France. They're not making as much money as the Premier yeah. League, sure. But they're getting through these fixtures, right? So there is an issue with congestion, I think. I mean, if you can't solve the congestion problem, then obviously make you know, different squads for different tournaments. So you can switch in an instant. This might just work. No, that's why you see the big teams over there, the Premier League giants over there, the likes of Chelsea, Liverpool, Manchester City, to some extent Manchester United. Yeah, have enough squad depth. They have in squad there. depth over mm. there. And why do you win trophies? Why do you win multiple trophies? It's by squad depth and by using those players at the right mm. time too. And another important thing is not having injuries because injuries mm. can actually cause harm to your, your championship qualities over here too. The so real Chelsea. Yeah. Yeah. Of course, of course. The real Chelsea. Yeah. So that's why I feel that over here that squad depth is going to be very important for these big teams like the likes of Liverpool, Chelsea and Manchester City mm -hmm. who are going uh, for big trophies. This going season. for big trophies, obviously this be does become a, a big of a concern but we've often seen that you know losses like these often might not mean much and there is a lot of focus for clubs like Tottenham as well but uh, big blow to Conte. I think uh, for the first major blow to him as a manager probably. This, this club time. has broken Conte. Honestly, yeah. like yeah. it, the way he's speaking in press conferences saying like, oh, it must be me. That's the problem. This has never happened to me before in my career. Maybe they should get somebody. You know, I'm like, welcome to the uh, Premier yeah, League. <laughs> I'm watching and thinking, you've won a Premier League. And this is what Spurs has done. This club, you know, people on Twitter, they joke and laugh about it, but maybe they are cursed. You know, <laughs> you don't know because it's been a long time since they've won a trophy. They've gone through Jose Mourinho, look, he looks older. And, yeah, obviously he's older than when he came to Chelsea the first yeah. time. But at Spurs, he must have aged 10 years in like four <laughs> games. In like four games, they aged him 10 years. He looks so much older. And Conte looks like this is a man who has a lot of passion, mm. a lot of that. But he's also got a very good footballing mm. mind. And it just seems like, mm -hmm. I don't know, there's something about the club. And um, I don't blame the fans, obviously they have expectations. Maybe sometimes their expectations are too lofty considering their team hasn't delivered in so long. Yeah. But I really feel for him. I they had a lot to say. They kept on celebrating when they, they figured out Bale's going to return. Yeah. There are a lot to cheer about, but right now it is a mess. It's a huge mess right now. Uh, the problem over here, like Sabil mentioned, is that look, uh, Conte over here looks like a completely broken man over here. He has absolutely no idea what's going on. Mm -hmm. There's no connection between him and the upper hierarchy. When you have that, then you can see a disconnect. You can see that then the club, it filters in onto the team too. The, you know, you see inconsistent performance. Mm -hmm. The team which went and beat Manchester City, you know, just lost to Middlesbrough. So you're seeing a lot of inconsistencies over there. You see the big players aren't shining at the. This was a golden opportunity for them. Conte won this tournament in 2018 when they beat Manchester mm. United in the FA Cup final too. So this is another opportunity which has gone begging and I don't know what the future is for Conte because Conte needs to finish now in that top four. If he doesn't do it, then I think it's probably uh, he will be seen. You know, for far too long we've seen going. this injustice where managers have come in and even after a little, a little stint, they've been shown the door. It, it's embarrassing for the game itself. I think Conte will be relieved if he gets away from his best. <laughs> but you're right, that's an awful trend. I think long uh, gone are the days where Alex Ferguson was given a decade just to settle yeah. into the role. And that, and that proved, yeah. Yeah, that showed. It can happen, yeah. you know. Uh, the way I look towards the end of Wenger's reign, I wasn't too keen on him as well. But I think the way the fans behaved in some parts, a minority of fans, but still, I, I, you know, there's a way to get rid of a mm. manager. And then you have to get in a permanent replacement. We don't give managers enough time. Uh, it's all about instant results. And some clubs don't do that. Some clubs still give you a bit of mm -hmm. time. I think uh, it depends where you go and at what level. But in the Premier League, it does seem like there's too much chopping and changing. There's too much uh, reactionary measures taken by boards. And that doesn't always work. It works actually very rarely. Uh, that's why such mm -hmm. a few clubs have success doing it. So I think we need to get back to this 
culture of where board just trust their manager and fans look where the fans are talking on social media putting pressure on a club and then they you're the board if you back a manager you can then if you say look give it 5 years regardless of what the fans say right and if we have success we have success if you actually back the manager yeah. give him financial support mm-hmm. let him bring in his players and then it fails and then with it you also take a step back and like look as the board maybe i resigned from my position because i supported this take that risk but nobody wants that on there yeah, nobody absolutely. wants that pressure Too much, on there. Yeah. so they're all bringing it on the manager mm-hmm. look uh, Roy Keane said this that your 11 players on the pitch you do your job right uh, f- when uh, Jose Mourinho left Chelsea uh, you know when they won the league the next season they finished like i think 10th below Stoke mm-hmm. i would like to point out <laughs> <laughs> uh, f- uh, you know Fabregas went on uh, Monday night football mm-hmm. stormbot you know we let the manager down because he gave us too much freedom yeah. he was too good to us so players need to take responsibility too it's the same group of players that have uh, seen multiple managers sacked they need to do better speaking of you know like you said that they let manager you have a manual for how to get rid of ownership of the club yeah, well. <laughs> i don't know the managers anymore <laughs> get a few billion pounds and buy the club <laughs> <laughs> you know things will work but sabil and ali mehdi thank you very much for being on the show let's take a look at our segment recap we of course discuss an exciting night for football an exciting night for middlesbrough fans where they were able to beat tottenham hotspur and of course this was an fa cup tottenham are now out of the race and uh, the party obviously was there in middlesbrough and they, their fans have deserved it as well but alan shearer has really blasted conte's side and he had a lot to say about that as well but middlesbrough are in the quarter finals that's all that matters now obviously that wraps up our two segments but before we go it's going to be of course goodbye from me and the entire team but we've got something very special so we're going to leave you with that so do take a look and let us know uh, obviously on social media and with your comments of what you I uh, feel like this this is something what I watched and I wanted to share with everybody who's watching I thought this was something beautiful from the piece of history so let's just take a look at that and from me and the entire team it's goodbye for now so I was playing with uh, Marco Mirra this is 97 and so it was a week prior to the Masters and we chit off on the back nine at Isleworth and I par 10 birdie 11 and 12 I eagle 13 a birdie 14 15 16 17 18 and 1 and I have a f- I have a three iron into number three, the par five, I make par. I have a five iron into number seven, the par five, and I make par. And I still shoot 59. So I had an opportunity to shoot something even really lower. Did that give you some confidence for what happened a couple weeks later? Well, that and the next day, too. What happened the next day? Well, I, we, we cheat off on 10 again, and I, I birdie 10, and then make a hole in one on 11. and then mark left. <laughs> so it was it was a hell of a two days and I've never shot 60 in my life. I've shot I've shot 61 a bunch of times. Um but I've never shot 60, I've only shot 59.